right, all right, all right. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the State of the Nation. My name is Henry Sully, uh, and this is the State of the Nation. We are going to be discussing issues uh, pertaining to the political landscape of Uganda. Uh, before I start, uh, as, as I always do, I am going to acknowledge the land on which uh, we work or serve. Uh, so we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto African Alumni Association operates for thousands of years. It has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendant, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across the Tato Island, and we are grateful for the opportunity to serve uh, on this land. Before uh, I proceed uh, with this conversation, uh, I'm pretty sure that there are so many people uh, who are still uh, gathering uh, themselves so that they can join us uh, uh, on this platform. Uh, we do have two guests coming from Kampala. Uh, their internet might be a problem. If it proves to be problematic, we are going to switch uh, to Zoom, in which case uh, you will be watching us uh, on YouTube, and we shall share that conversation here on Facebook. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Henry Sully uh, for the African Alumni Association and the State of the Nation. All right, all right, all right, all right. Singa Simuchala, Singa Sasuma, Singa Simama, Singa Siri Wendy. Uh, my name is Henry Sully of the African Alumni Association at the University of Toronto. Uh, and this is the state of the nation. Uh, that song is dedicated to all the mothers. I know Mother's Day was last Sunday. Uh, we did not have uh, this conversation last, uh, last Sunday. So I'm taking this opportunity uh, to wish each and every mother out there, especially those who are doing twice who are acting as mothers and uh, and fathers uh, so single mothers uh, we appreciate you we see you we love you uh, thank you so much for the great job that you do this is the state of the nation uh, and without any further ado uh, allow me to start by introducing the conversation as you all know uh, President Museven was sworn in for the sixth time as President of the Republic of Uganda. After this new term, he will have made 40 years in power. But what has he done? And what does he intend to do in the next five years? Many things have been evaluated. Many words have been said about him, uh, about his government, about his uh, nature uh, of governance, his characteristic as a leader, characteristics as a leader, uh, and so many other things. Today we have uh, a few panelists, some of uh, whom you already know, because you interact with them on a daily basis, either uh, in the media in Uganda or on Facebook. Uh, one of our guests today is uh, Dr. Jimmy Spire Sentongo. Uh, we do have Dr. Stella uh, in the house and we do have uh, Mr. Julius Mitala Muzukuruam uh, Swangari. As you already know, uh, he is a regular here. Uh, our guest today is uh, Dr. Jimmy uh, Spire Sentongo and uh, Without wasting your time, I'm going to bring them. Yeah. So, Mr. Mitella, you're going to have to uh, mitigate some background noise, I think. Because uh, you're going to be introducing yourself soon. Uh, Dr. Jimmy Spire St. It's a pleasure to have you at the State of the Nation. Uh, I hope you are excited to be here. 
as excited to be here as we are to, to receive you. Dr. Uh, Dr. Nyanz will be joining us uh, shortly. Uh, right. So, Thank you very much, Henry. As always, I hope I hope my background my background noise has been minim minimized now. Yes. Yeah, you know the, the the joys of parenthood when you've got youngsters sitting around you, and they want to join the conversation. You know, they they, they are also interested in what's going on. That's why the where the, the the background noise was coming from. But besides that, uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Henry. Uh, we were not here last week. Uh, I think we gave ourselves a break, and as Henry said, it was Mother's Day. And of course, I do extend also my my my, my appreciation to all the people who play that role, whether they are women or whether they are men or whether they are in whatever capacity they do it. I do extend, you know, my appreciation to you. Without people playing a role like that, I think the world would be incredibly difficult. Uh, I'm glad to, to be sat here with uh, Mr. Jime uh, Sentongo, or Mr. Spire, as he's popularly known, the great artist. Your, 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 your artistic works, they are, they are beautiful, I must say. I'm, I'm, one of, I'm one of the fans who follow your works you know, with a passion. By way of introduction, without wasting too much time, Julius Mitala is my name. I'm a trained lawyer. My area of specialism is mental health, human rights, deprivation of liberties, doors, and things that go in that area. Uh, I am based in London. I've been here for several years, and I am a regular here. It's, uh, it's, it's, my, it's my small ways of making a small contribution uh, to make sure that we all do something productive and useful in an effort to make mother, mother home a better place for all of us to live. Thank you very much, Henry. You are most welcome. Uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Uh, Dr. Doctor, Doctor Spire or Dr. Sentongo to unmute himself and introduce himself. Uh, so you have to unmute yourself, Dr. Sp uh, Dr. Spire, Dr. Dr. Jimmy Sen uh, Sentongo. Unmute yourself. No audio. Oh, okay, so we just lost, uh, we just lost him. Uh, like I said, uh, StreamYard is, is is a very heavy platform, uh, so we might we, we might have to switch to 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 to, to, to Zoom if uh, if our guests are having trouble with this platform. So give us a few a few give us a few. Uh, please bear with us. Uh, I'm going to play some music as uh, I contact my guests to ensure that, uh, uh, to ensure that they are in good state. Uh, so we're gonna play some music for you. Uganda Zukuka, Uganda Zuka, Uganda Zukuka. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, we are going to stay here for um, a, a few minutes. If we are having trouble with uh, this platform, we shall switch to Zoom. It is ready, uh, but you will be joining us v uh, via YouTube. Uh, we're going to bring back our guest Spire, to introduce himself. Uh, Dr. Spire, welcome to the State of the Nation. Uh, do you hear us now? Yes, I can hear you. I don't know whether you can hear me. Yes, can we you do hear, me hear now? you. Uh, welcome to the... Yes, we do hear you. Welcome to the State of the Nation. Tell the people who are watching you who you are and why you're excited to be here today. I'm Jimmy Spire Sentongo. I'm a cartoonist, an editorial cartoonist with uh, Observer newspaper in Uganda. And uh, I'm a lecturer at Uni Uganda Matters University and Makerere University. I teach philosophy. Yeah, basically that's it in brief about me. And I'm happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. We are very excited to have you. Welcome. And uh, thank you for accepting you. our invitation. Uh, thank we you. Are waiting thank for, you. Yeah, we are waiting for Dr. Stella Nyanzi. She will be joining us uh, shortly. Uh, but I think we should uh, 
move on and uh, start the conversation. As you all know, we do have a new president in Uganda, one that has been sworn in, or was previously sworn in uh, for his sixth term uh, to govern as head of state uh, for the country. Uh, but as you all know, uh, I read uh, I, I read your, uh, your 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 submission on uh, on Wednesday, uh, Doctor Spire. Uh, it looks so much uh, as an artistic uh, uh, parody, to my in my opinion, which, which was very true in, in terms of how you expressed or exaggerated uh, the goodness of the new government and how the, 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 the people should uh, were excited about uh, receiving the new government. Uh, of course, uh, for the people who understand the issues of Uganda, uh, they did understand uh, the article. I'm just uh, uh, excited to hear from you. Uh, what was going through your mind writing that? Of course, it's so similar to the, to the, to the cartoons that, that, that uh, uh, that you draw mm. on a daily basis, based on the mm. situation, of course, uh, in which mm. the country being uh, on expressing yourself uh, or expressing mm. the feelings of the people uh, that see what is going on in Uganda. But uh, uh, I just want to get into your mind, try to uh, to find out what were what was going through your mind when you were composing uh, that article. Mm. Oh, you mean the article? It's uh, titled "It's Joy Everywhere." I'm seven is swearing. Joy. joy everywhere. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, certainly. That's what that's what was going on in my mind. It was joy. You were in celebration, as, as I said in the article in our neighborhood. It was uh, merry everywhere. Uh, of course, merriment that we are getting a new president who had been very democratically elected. Uh, despite all the challenges that he faced uh, through the electoral process or being uh, harassed by the opposition, that right. his entire campaign team had been ambushed and uh, thrown into jail, but he still managed to come up with 58%, uh, I think, in a free and fair election, would have scored uh, maybe 90%. But nevertheless, since he managed to come up with that in a very unfair election, made unfair by the opposition, we were celebrating, nevertheless. So that's what uh, the article is basically about. Yes, uh, this is uh, the most democratically elected president uh, of Uganda, as mm -hmm. you <laughs> as you can uh, mm -hmm. uh, imagine, as people can imagine. Mr. Mitala, what went what, what through your, your, your mind when you are reading the, uh, Dr. Spire's article? Because uh, as an artist, uh, he tries to portray things uh, in an ironic way, uh, how things are evolving in Uganda. Things are evolving. Uh, as a lawyer uh, and someone who did literature, uh, as far as I remember, uh, imagine it's 2050. How would you read that article? <laughs> You know what? It's 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 very it's always very nice to to be able to laugh about uh, a sad state of affairs. You know, <laughs> you know, for us in Uganda, for instance, when you lose somebody, even at a funeral, you know, people tend to ask you, "How are you?" Literally in Uganda, what's Osiyotia? What's Uzotia? And your response is, "Ndivurunjo na Sivyevurunjo." In spite of you know the the unfortunate you know event that that might be surrounding you so i think uh it, it's it's incredibly important especially in this in, in these times where we are it's very important for us to be able to find something to laugh about because in one way it, it kind of uh it's soft it softens you know the 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 hardness of the hearts as the as the current saying goes the mitima jakaruba you know the mitima jakaruba there are quite a lot of things that are, are really funny and they are really very difficult to conceptualize you know seriously uh as 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 as, as jimmy but and i think for me i'm, I'm more familiar with uh with, 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 the, with the catalog of, of cartoons the sequence and the transformation the evolution of uh, the president from uh 1986 you know 
where some of his, uh, you know, close lookalikes are telling him in a whisper, you know, that don't, don't speak so much, don't say that, because otherwise, you know, the chap next door, the chap next to you might be might be upset or he might get angry with, uh, with what you're saying. But it is it, it, it is uh, it is a serious representation of the misfortune that uh, the democratic misfortune, I think, as a country that we have suffered. I think it's unthinkable, and I don't think anybody ever imagined it that that's this is where we are going to end up to be. I mean, coming off the backs of uh, the president himself back in 1986 when he took power, when many of us were very very small boys, you know, possibly still wearing, you know. Uh, you know, pampers or possibly not properly trained to use, you know, pit latrines and things like that. The president himself said that the danger of uh, of, of African existence is leadership so, of, of leaders who come in power and they refuse to go. And uh, we we, uh, we we have a situation where uh, I, I don't know. People always say people always make a statement and they say that if Mr. Museveni of today looked at himself or looked at the Mr. Museveni of 1986. Perhaps the two would not recognize each other, and they might, you know, get into a serious fight. But that's 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 the unfortunate state of affairs, you know, where we are. I think for me, it's saddening. I would very much like, in my time, before I'm too old, to be able to witness a different kind of leadership. And I think there is every positive in having a change of leadership, and more so a democratic and peaceful change of leadership. The way I look at it is that there is no two people who can do things in a similar way. If you look at the exact example of what happened down in Tanzania, you know, with our colleagues in Tanzania, they had the misfortune of losing a president whom they loved and admired very much. He had just won an election. I think he won an election by about uh, 96% or something like that. He was quite popular, you know, even by the, by, by the standards of, 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 the, of Tanzania. He was quite a popular guy. but upon him leaving office in the manner in which he left office and a new person, you know, acceding power, you have seen a serious change of direction. And I think that is the sort of uh, situation we would be expecting. That is the sort of situation we desire to have, that, you know, there needs to be some bit of change of direction. It's very difficult to imagine a situation where we are down into an era of 40 years of rule. And it's, it's, People are even worried that it might go all the way to 50 years. I think I just can't imagine that it's really worrisome. And I, I, I don't know where it's really going to lead us, but we are all hope, optimistic and hoping that, you know, possibly uh, the, 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 the big man will find some, some ways and, you know, he might reflect and say he needs to be a statesman and allow the young generation to come into power so that we can see a different direction, the country moving in a different direction. So that, in, in a nutshell, that's that's my starting point. I think that would be my observation on that. All right, thank you so much. Uh, you are hoping for a statesman. Uh, unlike uh, uh, unlike uh, uh, Spire, uh, Father Musala had a completely different uh, <laughs> approach mm -hmm. Uh, to the state of affairs and this is what uh, he, he, this is a snippet of what he had to say i don't know what gives you joy but jesus says he will give us his joy in time yesterday i was wandering around the city on the day of swearing in And I didn't see much joy. Having received a new president, one would expect that there would be celebrations at every corner. I didn't see even one. But there were soldiers, paramilitaries, roadblocks and a slight atmosphere of fear. And my prayer was that one day we will have joy in Uganda. One day we will have joy in Uganda.
one day we will have joy in Uganda. Do, uh, Dr. Spire, when mm. is the coming? The day that we are going to experience the true joy uh, that you demonstrated in that article, where the opposition will be uh, the one that is expected. <laughs> uh, and uh, this rule, when is that day coming? Oh. Well, I I don't know how I sh I don't know how I should answer that, but away from the sarcasm and the satire, uh, and as you also put it in the introduction, we are really in a, a very sad situation. It's unfortunate that now this is the language that we uh, you know that song, but you know that song? The internet, the internet. Uh, yeah, so we are facing challenges with the internet. I might be uh, forced to switch to, to, to Zoom uh, so that we can be, uh, we can get a better, Okay, yeah. So this this is what happens sometimes. Uh, I think I think I'm gonna have to switch to Zoom to a different kind of Zoom because this is uh, this is not Zoom. Uh, most people think it is Zoom, uh, but it's not. The internet is not very good right now. Uh, Okay, so, yes, with that being said, I, I think I'm going to have to switch to Zoom. Uh, but uh, as I switch to Zoom, as I, uh, let me ask, let me, let me ask him if he wants us to switch. Um, are we together? Yeah, we are together. Do you want us to switch to Zoom? Uh, well, I don't know whether it would be better, but... Let's first continue trying this and see if it get if we get another problem, then we can switch. Uh, okay, all right. So we were only listening. Yeah, so I was. Yeah, I was still saying that it's unfortunate that we have gotten to this point when we all talk as if we are in total desperation, as if we are lost of options. And I was asking if you heard that song by the Rivers of. Babylon is like right. we are yes. singing of the rivers of Babylon where we sat down, hey, uh, we wept uh, when we right. remembered Zion. Uh, the wicked carried us away in captivity. Uh, so it's like we are singing that song, uh, unfortunately. And um, I've sadly watched the trend how we have moved from the messages that the opposition or those who are trying to bring about change were putting across in the campaigns up until now. And you see some sort of uh, a cycle that we are moving from. Uh, we are removing a dictator. We shall wear the victor's crown. And then finally, we are handing everything to God. So it's only God who knows when that day is going to come. And I think for a people to get to that point when they can only wait on the uh the salvation of god where they can only wait for god to rescue the situation i think uh, that is um, a very unfortunate situation we witnessed as father msala said in that clip that even on the day of swearing in where you would have expected that the victor would be uh, the victor and his supporters would be in celebration because 50 58 percent which was announced by the electoral commission is quite a, a significant percentage. You would have expected that there would be in celebration, there would be joy, but all you saw were just a few staged people who were celebrating. The entire city was as if we are in a state of war, as if uh, we were at some sort of a day when a, uh, 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 the uh, Right. Yeah. 
we, we, we are missing you. You are skipping here a little bit. You are missing here a little bit. But uh, uh, just to add on uh, what you are saying, uh, I'm not sure if you are hearing us well right now. Uh, but just to put everything in perspective. Well, I should out when that. Great. Great, great. Oh, my goodness. Uh, my goodness. So we keep uh, we keep missing uh, we keep miss we keep skipping uh, this conversation will continue with or without uh, the internet uh, in Uganda. Thank you so much to everyone who is watching us, who is following us. If you have any questions, comments, please don't hesitate uh, to use your uh, comment section to uh, to communicate with us. Uh, there is a um, conversation that I wanted to share, but I want to share it in the presence of uh, both Jimmy and uh, Stella. I don't know what's wrong with Stella. Uh, she's, she was supposed to be with us, uh, but she's having uh, challenges, I think, herself. Uh, what do you think, Mr. Mitala? Do should should we go to Zoom? I think Zoom is more favorable. But uh, I think I think uh, I think for the benefit of the the rest of the guests, the guests, I think it, if it, if Zoom is gonna give a better experience, perhaps we should change and go to Zoom. Because well, as you say, this platform is a bit heavy traffic. It's heavy heavy streaming. It is I heavy. People might be struggling with it. So why don't we try the other one? We should be able to accommodate because we really don't want to to, to lose the input of people like Jimmy. He's, he's no. telling us something that's very, very constructive and something that's very useful. I think it's really for the benefit of uh, our followers and fans to make sure that they can feed into what, what he has to say. Yeah, I think uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but with that in mind, I have to. Thank you so much for everyone who is following us. I'm going to give you some music. Oh, uh, 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 Jimmy is back. Jimmy is back. Uh, so sweet. Uh, because the, uh, I'm not sure if uh, Stella knows what we are going to do. If she, she's even able to log in. Uh, Mr. Setongo, you are talking about uh, the unfortunate events of, uh, of Uganda, aside from the, 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 the satire that you actually wrote. Uh, um, I think, in my opinion, you are, you, you, you're, you're trying to, to bring across the fact that in this new government, there's no will of the people. The people have completely resigned to the extent uh, that now they are relying on God to save them, to come and save them. We are. Yes, that's basically what I was saying, and that it's unfortunate that we can get to a point where we can only call on God, especially in a country that you call a democracy. Our will would have been expressed and heard, and people would be celebrating that, yes, we chose a president, and here he is swearing in. But on the day of swearing in, we are cursing, we are praying for rain, we are praying for all sorts of misfortune <laughs> to happen at the event where uh, he's swearing in. The entire city is deserted because the state itself is paranoid. Uh, they think, just like someone who is wearing clothes that are stolen, you think any time one can come for them. So the state is paranoid. They fear their own people, those they are swearing in to govern. But we can't even move freely in, in town. We can't freely uh, move in Kampala because they put soldiers everywhere. And that night, um, those of you who might not be in Uganda, you may not have witnessed what happened. I was moving around on a motorbike. By around 6.30 p.m., soldiers had already started beating up people who were uh, riding bikes. And the cafe was strictly, um, it was strictly, implemented on that day, although it has been there for a while. But on that day, it was like they were so keen to see that no one remains on the streets past 7 and for the motorists uh, past uh, 9 p.m. It all showed an environment where a government that claims they were elected democratically are afraid, are scared of the people they say elected them. And that's the whole irony, that if we love you so much, 
as our president, then you shouldn't fear us. You shouldn't exactly. chase us out of the streets of, of the city just because you're swearing in. And what shows that there has been a shift over time. Of course, uh, there were issues in the 2016 elections, 2011, uh, even 2006. But in those elections, maybe 2006 backwards, uh, and the swearing in 2006, 2000, 1996, you did not see that kind of mood. You did not see that kind of environment. That yes, there were issues, but the state ha still had some degree of legitimacy and they didn't exhibit this level of paranoia of fearing the people <laughs> that uh, they claim to be so popular among. So you would ask yourself, what is it that makes the state fear its people this much? Are they also aware that they are not loved uh, or maybe that they are not as popular as they claim? Do they fear that this was not their win? Do they feel that they do not have the legitimacy? So somehow it reports itself it, that one doesn't even have to say anything. If any foreigner came to Uganda on the day of swearing in and they moved around seeing the mood, uh, they would have known that there is a problem here. Yeah, so that's uh, why I say it's unfortunate on our side and we can't really tell when the day you ask me will come because it appears it's only worsening. Uh, every other election, it gets worse. 2016 was bad. Uh, 2021, 2020 have been worse than 2016 in terms of the things that have happened, the violence, uh, the kidnaps, uh, arrest of people on the opposition side. It's only getting worse. So what should we expect in 2026? So for a person who wants to have hope in their country, I don't know what clear message I would give them in terms of where we are going. Uh, it's uh, bleak, it's uh, insecure, unclear, uncertain. That's all I can say, unfortunately. It's bleak, it's unclear, it's uncertain. Uh, and the day of joy is nowhere to be seen. It's no, it's no, there's no mm. sleep. Right. Uh, to that it day. will certainly come, but we don't know when. Yeah. Ideally, we should have known when. Uh, we would have been looking out every election time, but elections yeah. have become totally meaningless, not just in 2021. We had been told earlier in 20, 2006, 2011, we saw it, uh, 2016, we saw it, but we kept having that lean hope that maybe it's going to change this and maybe it's going to change next time. And some who had already totally lost the hope just stayed on the side and told us, okay, if you still have hope in elections, just go and we see how far you would go. Um, it's uh, a bit uh, sad that even people who are on the opposition side are those among those who are now saying, uh-huh, you who are saying that you're going to wear the victor's crown, where is the crown? <laughs> I've seen uh, my friend Dr. Stella Nyanz posting these last two days. Uh, there was this morning she posted, uh, no, yesterday, Tajakulaira, like somehow bringing back uh, the things that were being promised before. And then today, uh, posting, uh, we are removing a dictator. We are removing a dictator. Yes, yeah. so it's some sort of mocking those who are defeated, but it's also a way of. Uh, telling each other, other that you see, uh, uh, you still had this hope, but it's impossible under the kind of uh, basically would li like Dr. Basie likes calling it a junta that under this junta don't expect that kind of change. But the question is, if you don't expect that kind of change, what kind of change should we expect? Should we expect the 1986 change? Should we expect the change of, uh, uh, we are calling on God now by natural means that when the president dies is when we can see change happen, which I think would be, wouldn't be ideal. We don't know what would happen if he dies. It might not be the Tanzania situation because Tanzania has a different kind of setting and history. We might not really follow what the constitution says that in the event that a president dies in office, this is what happens. 
even within the ruling party itself, with all its excesses, they are quite divided. You can't expect that they would simply want to uh, to come and usurp the power and one person would be uh, the one looking at the seat. There would be a number of people within the factions that are there. So that's why I said earlier that it's bleak. We can't clearly tell where it's going. We can't clearly tell where it's going. It's, it's very funny mm. that you, you have brought that up. And uh, uh, I, I wonder if we should be uh, we should look closely to the parliament of Uganda, especially as this one is, is fading away. Uh, do, should we have hope in the, in the new parliament? The, the, one of the most uh, uh, influential, so, somewhat influential ministers of Mr. Museven, one who, who even had a direct contact uh, with him, uh, uh, the former minister of land, Nantawa, had a couple of uh, mm. things to say to, to, to his parliamentarians and specifically uh, to, to the Speaker of Parliament in regards to how the forests are being handled uh, and uh, pretty much taking away all the hope that borrowing money to sustain those lands or to ensure that the, those forests are preserved is a myth. It's, it, it can't happen. He, I, 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 I don't wanna. Uh, I don't want to uh, to misrepresent her, so I'm going to uh, to play her clip here. Right, honourable speaker. I'm not the big fish here. <laughs> right, honourable. I, I I'm a victim actually. Right, honourable. I know that uh, the minister for finance. Uh, knows that parliament is agitated with the uh, loan approvals and and he has learned a way of packaging for parliament to approve easily because he knows when he brings a loan touching environmental protection and restoration of our protected areas that are in bad state he knows that uh, people will support but uh, to add my voice to Honorable Nandala's issue, this is money that is going to be thrown to, to the dogs again because the, 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 the loan is packaged, the will is good, but you can't see results when some forests are already registered in the names of the big fish. We already have forests that are already taken some are just waiting. NFA allows deforestation, and once a full forest is depleted, the land grabbers move in. And when NFA runs to court, it is always a game between the big fish and NFA. They pretend as if they are running to court to protect the, 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 the forest, and the judge moves to the ground when there are no trees, and he says, I didn't find a, a tree here. And I bought this land from the district land board. So it is a game. The forests are already titled in the names of private individuals. That even if you approve loans, they are wasting time. Kayunga's three forests, two are gone. Even the one left is about to be taken because someone has moved in, planting sugarcane. Even the, the rest, the one remaining is about to go. I won't come back here to present the same issue because Parliament has become so powerless that it can't even protect what it has gazetted. Yes. Has Parliament become so weak that it can't even gazette what, uh, I mean, protect what they have gazetted? Is this the, the kind of Parliament that we are going to have with the sixth, uh, the sixth Governor, uh, sixth term, uh, Mr. Museven. Uh, what, what, what comes to mind when you hear that, Mr. Muswanga? Muswanga. I think, as, uh, as 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 Jimmy has said, and I think I referenced it myself at the beginning that uh, I think as a country we've suffered a very serious misfortune. And to be honest, uh, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I've got enough. The perfect answers to how we ride out of that you know misery that we find ourselves stuck in at this point in time but i think uh, 
let's not let's stop this business of kidding ourselves. I think the the idea of, of of who really has power in Uganda is not really questionable. Everybody knows where the power is, and if you're not anywhere near that circle of people who have power, regardless of where you are, whether you're a minister, whether you are a soldier, whether you are a district administrator, whether you're a member of parliament, the person who has power is just one. Mr. Museveni has allocated all the powers of the state from A to Z to himself. And I think, uh, obviously, that was not the intention of the people who drafted the constitution. And I think some of the arguments that existed at the time when the constitution was being put in place was to try to limit the powers of the president, because the more power the president has, the more difficult it gets, you know, for us to get anything positive out of him, because then he begins to see the state as himself, and that's where we are at this point in time. So to answer your question, is, is Parliament is, is Parliament any useful? Do they have the power to to do anything that can, uh, you know, uh, put some restraint on, on on the executive? I doubt not. And possibly this is why the hassle that's going on in Parliament to, to, to decide who is going to be the next speaker is critically important. Because I think we previously visited this debate, and uh, one of the things that was on consensus that in order for the Parliament to be effective, you need to have somebody there who's got the stamina, somebody who's, who is able to be brave and stand up to the, to the emperor and tell him that, you know, what you are asking us to do is not something that we are willing to do because it's not within our powers to do it or it's not within your powers to do it. But the, the, we, we, we are, and this is, this is the question that has been said many times. It's no longer a new concept. It's no longer a new idea. We are living in a military dictatorship. It's what it is, this whole business of, uh, of you know, parliaments. And I, and I even wonder, to be honest, uh, Suggestions have already been put forward that why does even Mr. Museveni pretend to, to go to elections? Well, what benefit does it really serve him? You know? Right. I think it would be it would be better for him, truly honestly, if he stood up and stood up and with a straight face and told the nation that you know he's not interested in subjecting himself to uh, to, to, to the electoral process so that he can handle the country in a manner in which he does, because obviously uh, the way the, his wish is his wish, and nobody else can get anything other than his wish. So the question of the, the question that you're asking is uh, is a no brainer. Um, we know where the power is, and until when that question is sorted, I've already said. Until when we, we sort the question of leadership, these problems are always going to be part and part of part and part parcel of us. It's very uh, funny that uh, Mr. Museven wasn't even. Uh, very uh, cordial with uh, the international community because uh, it seems he has not just lost the Ugandan diaspora, he has also lost uh, trust. Uh, it, it seems uh, it, he has also lost trust among his international allies. Uh, but the way he spoke during his, his inauguration uh, uh, speech uh, was very telling about how he feels, uh, not just about Ugandans but also about his international allies. Uh, he seems to be very, seems to be very uh, upset uh, about how the international community has interacted with him uh, throughout the campaigns uh, uh, and after post campaigns. Uh, his opposition, uh, his rivals, of course, also uh, have showed him that he's not the, 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 uh, the, the the biggest player internationally, because they seem to have captured the international media, and uh, they seem to be making, uh, penetrating the influencers in the, uh, in, in, the, in the international community. Mr. Museven had this to say in his speech. The situation in Libya was created by the arrogant and irresponsible actions of some actors that took actions that were against the express position of the African Union. I can reveal to you that those actors had a narrow escape. When some actors started attacking Libya against the decision of the African Union, I contacted His Excellency Jacob Zuma of South Africa and proposed 
that African armies that so decided to intervene in Libya and confront and teach a lesson to those aggressors. We were let down by Muammar Gaddafi, who abandoned Tripoli without a fight. Although at that time I did not have a direct link with Muammar Gaddafi, I advised his envoy who came to see me here to turn Tripoli into a studying grad. With H.E. Jacob Zuma, we had to work out a solution for the aircrafts and cruise missiles that some people use to attack defenseless people from far away so that if the, if the aggressors so wished could come on the ground and we fight man to man. Such a confrontation would of course have been imposed on us unnecessarily. We have since a long time ago started the stated that the African patriots, like we in the NRM, are neither pro-West nor pro-East. We are first and foremost pro-Africa. Mr. Museven seems to suggest that he's so pro-African, even though he actually uh, misled uh, one of the, uh, the, the representation in, in that speech uh, was not correct, was incorrect, because uh, of course, South Africa voted in favor of uh, attacking Libya, in favor of the, interna the, the, the international community attacking Libya. Uh, when he says that he contacted him, that's, uh, that's a misrepresentation of facts. Uh, it's a lie. Uh, but also when we go back uh, historically, Mr. Museven, uh, in, in his conversation with uh, President Reagan, uh, he explicitly said that he was fighting he started fighting Gaddafi in 1979. Uh, so this just thumping that uh, Mr. Museven has started with on his very first day in office, in his sixth term, do, do you think Mr. Museven is afraid that the international community <coughs> to come and uh, host him or uh, work with uh, uh, some sort of uh, internal forces to get uh, rid of him? Uh, what are your thoughts on, uh, on that? Why, why do you think his speech was so aggressive, uh, especially towards uh, the international actors? Spire. Um, yeah. Well, in the first place, um, I would say that under normal circumstances, we would have been behind the president in saying that um when he stands up against foreigners against the uh, suppression of africa against manipulation of africans all sorts of neocolonialism or tendencies towards uh, controlling africa through whatever mechanisms that are used by the west i think many of us would have been behind the president in saying that but the irony is that now, given all that we have observed, given what we are going through as a country, even when he makes such utterances that are otherwise exciting, they are, we are not excited. Why aren't we excited as Ugandans when uh, President Seven is telling off uh, America, because this seems to be mostly geared towards America, UK, and maybe the European, European Union, that we would have been celebrating this, that we have a president who is able to take his ground like a pan, as a Pan-African and tell them that we are not going to allow this. So the question, the first question is, why is it that we are not excited by these messages? Maybe there are a few people who are excited. It's because when you put them in the context of when he utters them, when you try to understand the situation, you try to understand the background to what he's saying, then you realize that these statements are not really made in good faith. And by good faith, I mean that they're not genuinely Pan-African. We have had him as president for the last uh, 36 years. 
And yes, to a certain extent, I would admit he has been a Pan-Africanist to some extent, especially in the earlier years. And in those years when he would stand up, the few times he would stand up against the West, many of us were behind him. But you see that over time along the way, he seemed to have changed track, even the way he viewed the West, that when the West is funding him, when the West is behind the training of his military, behind arming him, giving him all these things that are used now to oppress Ugandans, he does not complain. So the rest, the West only becomes bad, those foreigners or aggressors, they only become bad when they tell him that, look, uh, the, what we are seeing in your country is not democratic. When they tell him respect human rights, when they tell him to stop brutalizing Ugandans, to stop the kidnaps, if that's what it means to be Pan-African, is that you have to resist even when uh, foreigners are telling you the right thing, then many of us would want to jump out of that ship of Pan-Africanism. I myself would consider myself Pan-African to some extent, but I wouldn't associate with the Pan-Africanism that was in that uh, speech. That the speech plays some rhetoric to try to bring us all together into some uh, bandwagon. The bandwagon that this is a war against Africa. This is a war of the West against Ugandans. But I don't think it's really a war against Uganda or it's a war against Africa. What did the West do or say that is prompting his anger? It's mostly about them telling him about his excesses. Now, if we Ugandans are the victims of those excesses, do you expect us to be sympathetic towards the president uh, coming up with that uh, Pan-African rhetoric? We have seen this is not new. A number of African leaders who over time developed dictatorial tendencies towards the end of their terms of their time in office they start playing the Pan-African card. They start playing uh, 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 to the gallery with those Pan-African messages. Gaddafi did that. Of course, Gaddafi was good in some ways to his people, in many ways to his people. But when he became excessive, still you saw that's when he started allying more with the rest of Africa and then identifying with the kings around Africa and pushing for the unification of Africa. Mobutu did the same. Uh, Mugabe, uh, many of the messages that Mugabe was sending out against whites or against uh, uh, imperialists, as you would call them, in themselves they were correct and they were appealing. But if you were a Zimbabwean listening to those messages, I don't think you would get the same feeling as an outsider. For most of us outsiders, Ugandans, we would be excited because we were not facing the brunt of what was happening to the Zimbabweans under their own. Um, so in the same way, a person who attended this swearing and listened to the speech of the president, especially if they were not familiar with the politics of Uganda, not knowing the entire background, they would say, wow, Uganda has such a wonderful president. So any Pan-Africanist would be wowed by the uh, the speech that the president gave. But we as Ugandans, we know the timing. We know why he's saying that at this time, especially telling the people that are funding many of the schemes of uh, the same government, why are they only bad when they tell him about that? That's the way in which I would look at um, what many others would say was a Pan-African message. Personally, I don't think it was uh, uh, it was genuinely Pan-African. It was just rhetoric that is meant uh, to garner some emotions, emotional support from people that is us against the West. Good enough, many Ugandans have started, uh, are able now to read behind all these kinds of sentiments around the, uh, the passing of the Anti-Homosexuality Act. Uh, I think we had the same kind of scenario of the president coming out strongly to say that, no, this is, uh, we, we are Africans, we have to stand up uh, for our culture, and it's not the West to tell us what to do. At that time, many Ugandans were behind the president. Many of them, uh, because generally, I would say, of course, not to state my own position against 
against uh, sexual minorities. But many Ugandans uh, appear to be in support of that message, appear to be in support of that act. So they seemed at that time to look at it as a genuine message against foreign imposition of values, imposition of foreign preferences. But when it comes to this moment, I don't think many people would listen to him and they say that, okay, uh, talk back to those Westerners. Mm, I don't really. Yeah, it's very interesting. So, so it landed on stilt, it was a big born idea. Yeah, just like, just like you just said, uh, I don't think, even though most people might uh, be uh, interested or excited about his message, it's, it's very interesting to see that one of his closest allies, uh, President Paul Kagame, first he missed his inauguration, but uh, uh, some of the messages that he has uh, for him uh, also very strong messages and uh, uh, he seems to, to be talking to a, a similar kind of audience. Uh, so I think it's very important for us to evaluate the, how the, the, the two messages are going to be perceived by, 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 by the specific audiences. Uh, Mr. Kagame says uh, this. We can have as many lectures for as long as we want about integration, but integration of regions and communities and it does not happen just because you are making a slogan about it. No, it will happen and it happens because you are doing the right thing that actually needs to be done in order for that to be realized. Treat your neighbor as you want them to treat you. You can't just hunt down people from the neighboring country so badly. And then you, you go back and say, no, 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 these borders, you know, these border issues are, are rubbish. Or they are nonsense. No, what is more nonsense is what you do to your neighbor that actually creates that barrier. So for us, we, we, we don't play those games of setting fire to other people's homes. But we invest ourselves and everything we have in trying to make sure that uh, our homes, our houses are well protected. They don't uh, catch fire easily. And make sure that whoever wants to set fire on our houses will do it at a very huge cost to himself. <laughs> Ah, uh, what's <laughs> your response to that? I think as I said already, I think for me, I listen to the president. I don't usually want to listen to him because I'm one of those who have formed the strong opinion that, uh, you know, he's not somebody who can be trusted. He, he changes positions so quickly. Uh, if you look through back the years, there's been... Uh, lots of statements that have been attributed to Mr. M7 going back so many years where he has consistently told us time and again that you know this is the last time I'm, 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 I'm putting myself forward I'm going to retire in uh, 2006 I'm going to leave office on this such and such such a date and there is there's about six or seven occasions where statements of such a kind have been attributed to him and clearly he has no intention of leaving office in the current state as it is. So I think I think every Uganda needs to be uh, clearly alert to that and accept that's the tragedy that, uh, that, that, that we have walked into. But I think uh, for me, the disappointment thing is uh, that I think Mr. Museveni has missed the opportunity to be a statesman. 
And I think by insisting on uh, wanting to adapt a military approach to everything that he does, he misses the opportunity to persuade, you know, people who would otherwise be able to, to be persuaded and come along with him. As Fire has just said, you know, if you look at the domestic kind of situation where the country is, the level of uh, the level of fear, the level of uh, the level of brutality against uh, against his own people, who have, uh, you know, in honestly, they haven't committed any any, any serious crime that warranties to be treated the way they have been treated. You know, people who have been mined. I think there's been lots of reports that have been you know uh, presented even through the Uganda Human Rights Commission. You know, these things have been documented so well. You know, people are coming up on TV, you know, on various platforms, and they are saying, you know, they have been brutalized, you know, people's manhoods, you know, people have been, uh, they, they are inflicted with wounds that of, of a terrible nature. And when you really ask what crime these people have committed, you know, there is no particular crime that really can be attributed to them. Now, I think as, as Africans, of course, our, our unity and integration is critically important. You know, because we are one people. I think Africans we tend to suffer the disadvantage of discrimination across across the entire globe, if I should put it that way. I mean, I, I, I was reading somewhere this morning on Twitter via Mr. Charles Onyango Bo, and he was saying that Brazil became I think about a hundred years ago, Brazil, the country Brazil decided that it was uh, outlawing slavery and uh, People were very happy that it had taken that approach. But when you look at the experience of the black people in Brazil, you know, in the Amazons and so and so many other places, their experiences have not really been so so great, you know. So there is really there is there is a call which is of substance that you know, as Africans, as black people, we need to integrate more, do business more together, and I think uh, you know, drive our our own economic prosperity. But I think that progress has also to take into account the, 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 the aspect of uh, uh, human rights and civil liberties, you know? Because without that, you really cannot sustain something that you call economic prosperity or democracy without securing the liberties and freedoms of your people. And the freedoms of your people, this, this is things about, you know, freedom of expression. For people to be able to live without fear that the state is going to hunt down to hunt them down and there's no recourse you know to meaningful justice system i think that's really something which is uh, which is really shameful so i think uh, for me just to just, just to put it lightly as jimmy has just uh, you know referenced it uh, eastern seven has lost the opportunity to be a statesman really you know um i what i sense is i sense that mr seven is uh, is, 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 is calling on a fight. He's really uh, he, he's, he's elbowing people on and telling them, you know, I'm, I'm ready. I want a fight. He wants a fight. But I'm, I'm not quite sure whether he understands that he's not the Mr. Seven of 1986 or even you know, 2000. He's, 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 he's a Mr. Seven who is, who is who, who can now be called an, an old Mr. Seven. He's aged. You know, and therefore his, his, his ability to, and, and he always said that he can go back to the bush, and I doubt that he, he means that literally, but I think his ability to be able to withstand some of those things, they are not really as good as they were, you know, several years ago when he was a young man in his 40s. But uh, it kind of reminds me, you know, when we were young in school, you know, <laughs> If you had a disagreement with somebody, you would, you you would, you, it was it was common, you know, for you to tell them, you know, let's let's go and sort it out, you know, even when you really didn't mean mean what you said. And I I, I highly doubt that uh, Stan Seven means this also. And of course, as Jimmy said, I think uh, it is a speech that is designed to appeal to to the local to the local audience. But in what way it is supposed to appeal to the local audience, I don't really understand. And I think what I really find kind of alarming is that people tend to clap about these things. And I wonder whether they have really, you know, conceptualized, you know, the real issues behind before they even start to clap. So where we are, we're in a situation where it is not possible for anybody alive in Uganda today to give Museveni advice. It is not possible. That's why, from the multitudes of you know presidential advisors he has, I, I I doubt that they are able to reach out to him and give him you know sound advice 
And even if they do give him sound advice, I doubt that he will willing or even capable of taking that sound, that, that advice, as it would have been given to him by his advisors. So the, 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 somebody has written today in a monitor, and he was saying that the sorts of things that he was saying, he was, he was just thumping about a war which he actually never participated in. You cannot be on the sides and then begin, you know, it's like, it's like a cheerleader. He's like a cheerleader. It's, it's a war that he never participated in. Obviously, what has happened in Libya is sad. In its, by all means, it's sad, you know. Uh, I would say that uh, as bad as uh, Gaddafi was, he did manage to keep the country together. And Libya was uh, quite, quite a safe place to be. But again, it's easy for us maybe to say that because we were not in Libya and we were not in the receiving end. And again, as Jimmy has just said, you know, for anybody who is outside Uganda today or somebody who's not on the receiving end, if you hear the sort of things that the president is talking about, you would be excited about them. But if you are on the inside and you're actually seeing the suffering of the people, you know, the economic turmoil, we are told that the country is, is, is deep in debt in, uh, you know, billions and billions of, of, of US dollars, you know. In spite of the fact that over the last few years, uh, you know, we were eligible for a debt relief, and actually the World Bank and all the other international money lenders, they, they forgave us, they, they wrote off our debts, and we find ourselves back in a situation where, you know, the, the debt, debt levels are just seriously unsustainable and not manageable. And people are genuinely worried. People are genuinely worried about their well-being. People are worried about the the day-to-day, the day-to-day, you know, uh, services, you know, so, social services and public services. And those are things that are not being delivered. And here we have a president whose focus is to go and be on a war, very well knowing that it's possibly a war that he cannot, he cannot win, whether physically or whichever manpower he has, I doubt that he has the capacity to win that war. But also it brings in, it brings in something a, a little bit, a little bit quite awkward because obviously, we have we have our neighbors to start from, and as you've just been saying, there, have you seen the clip from uh, from, from from Mr. Paul Kazemi? We have our immediate neighbors there, and we seem to be having bad relationships with them. So, if we cannot sort out our immediate neighbors, how can we be able to sort out things that are far and beyond us? But I think the last point that I would like to make is that I doubt that. Africans, especially Africans of this generation, Africans who are young, Africans who are educated, Africans who are exposed, and Africans who understand the new international dynamics. I doubt that that is the message that they find comfortable from, from what the president is suggesting. And I think uh, people should, everybody in their sober minds should continue to talk down to Mr. Mm-hmm. Seven and ask him to request him to reconsider his position and more so to think about Uganda after him, because that is really something that's really important. He cannot escape that fact anymore. I think the earlier he confront that question, the better for the well-being of the nation altogether. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, it's very um, interesting that you have talked about the war that he did not participate in. Uh, and I would like to say that unlike in Uganda where doctors are planning to have a strike on Monday, tomorrow, uh, and teachers are very uh, poorly paid, uh, all other sectors, uh, service sectors, also suffering. Our hospitals are lacking uh, resources. Uh, I think when you compare Uganda today to where Libya was when... Uh, uh, Mama Gaddafi was hosted and thrown out by the international uh, actors. Now, I think Uganda shouldn't even be engaging in this conversation because many Libyans that I've spoken to, uh, some friends and some uh, just other, uh, scholarly work that we interacted with, indicates that uh, most people in Libya were doing much better uh, than they are doing today in terms of. Uh, mm. Uh, standards of living, the doctors, uh, <coughs> and payments, the teachers. I'm not sure we can have the same conversation uh, as Ugandans. Uh, I, I, I just, I just want to in, interject there very briefly. Sorry, Henry, to, to cut you short. I think, uh, you know, 
the message that Mr. Seven is giving the nation is just simple. He's, he's saying that he's not really interested in your in our plight as Ugandans. That's that's what he's saying. And actually, this is why this is why his his message was he doesn't want to be lectured about democracy. And when you talk about not being a lecture about democracy, because democracy entails listening to the voices of the people, including the people who did not vote for him. Let us assume that he won the election. And I'm just drawing this as a uh, hypothetically, because everybody knows that he didn't win the election. And maybe this explains why he's so angry, the manner in which you are angry. You know, when Wubango Bio Munyago, you know, I think it annoys Mr. Museveni very much, even the suggestion for people to say that he stole an election. Because I think what he ideally he would love to, to hear is that you know the, the, the entire nation loves him. And I'm not gonna discredit you that section of the population that actually believe in what he's doing. But if you take it on the on on, on, on the on level that uh, you know realistically did he win the election he didn't win the election he he, he just managed to to to, to cajole up the nation he's managed to maneuver himself around where he finds himself in a position where he's head of state but he lacks the legitimacy to call himself the head of state so i think what he's saying to the to the, to, to the ugandan public is that he doesn't have the solutions for our problems now he wants to extend the horizons to give himself a little bit of, you know, uh, I, th I think he's buying himself time. This is how I'm looking at it. Because obviously they, 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 at, a, at a domestic level, he's exhausted. There's nothing more for Mr. Museven to say to people that will be able to change their minds. The only way he can be able to continue to sustain himself, the way he's sustaining himself, is by being brutal, by being horrible as he is to people that, Either he perceives, or even those who are real, even the imagined one. I think there's this blanket sweep of anybody whom is assumed to be anti anti establishment, and I think that's uh, that's really where where the dynamics of this debate is, is. That there is nothing for him to offer any longer at a domestic level, and he needs to find something that justifies his continued grip on power without uh, 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 the consent of the people that he's governed. Spire, what are your thoughts on that? Mm, oh. Well, I think that uh, I'm in agreement with what uh, Mitala is saying. It appears, maybe to put it lightly, mm -hmm. uh, the president seems to be to have acquired some sort of a complex. I don't know whether he acquired it along the way or earlier on were not able to see it and it was there. And that complex, or you may call it a hubris, is where he looks at himself as some sort of a savior for the entire country, someone who is on a mission that the rest of us who may not agree with him on certain things simply do not understand. So anyone who doesn't agree with him, for him it means that this is a person who is against or who is not for the good of the country because the idea of what is good for the country is somehow um, exclusively in his mind. And you either conform to what is in his mind or you're, uh, you're some sort of a danger to the country. So with that kind of feeling, that kind of self-importance, uh, I think he's no longer able to appreciate any kind of criticism, no longer able to ac appreciate any disagreement with him. That's why for him, dissenters, dissenters have to be handled with a very strong hand because they are against the country and being against the country means being against him. So he's the country now, he's the state, he's the laws, he's our future, he's our past, apart from the bad past that he has. Um, and what you could have noticed uh, in many of his practices, the tendency to uh, to take all credit for things that are going well or things, even if by accident, they happen to be going on well. He wants to uh, uh, to appropriate all the credit. And I think all these are signs of someone who has that complex of self-importance. Uh, unfortunately, this complex ultimately brings the country down 
and it's not it's not really unique to him many leaders who have overstayed in power have acquired it that if you have a lot of power for a certain for a long period of time you start looking at yourself as some sort of a god you start looking at the country as though it's your own project as though it's at your mercy it only gets what you permit and what you don't permit it cannot get you can see some sort of an evolution in the speeches of M7 in his tendencies in what we see says that earlier on he would say is pro people even here by accident he says it these days but it has metamorphosed into i'm not your servant uh, metamorphosed into i'm on my own mission i'm a freedom fighter uh, so over time he has acquired that feeling that it's only him that knows what uganda needs and anyone outside that is uh, not good for uganda and this is the reason why uh, someone asked me the other day if i anticipate anything new or anything positive in the new term i said i don't really anticipate anything because you cannot have moved on the trajectory is on now and then after 36 years we expect that you're suddenly going to get some sort of uh, uh uh a change of heart you move in a different direction you don't expect that one he's still working with the same structures he's still working with the same people in his uh, huge patronage network he's still working with the same ethos so on what basis would one expect that there is going to be a difference and it's partly the reason why even when he promises new things now you don't see anyone getting excited over them he announced Oh, oh no. Oh. oh no, just uh Oh no, just uh yeah, so you're back, you're back. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so he announced that uh, no child should pay for anything at primary level and that would was something ordinarily you would expect people to clap for to be excited about. No one is really showing any excitement. You check where social media, no one is talking about it. I was in the village and I tried to talk to some people. Okay, now you don't have to pay anything. Hey, okay, you're telling us about things the president has promised. He has been promising for years. So right. do you expect him to do anything new with the same system, same structure, same people? Obviously, no. Yeah, that's uh, briefly my take. At, yeah, at thank you. President. <laughs> Thank you, Spire. The new old president. The new old president. <laughs> you, you know, you know, it's very, it's very good that we are having these conversations. But I also want to uh, go back to after. I think it was after twenty uh, two thousand. That's two thousand six. Two thousand eleven. I think it was after the two thousand eleven elections. Two thousand eleven elections. Two thousand six. Uh, not certain exactly, but uh, I want to talk about the emergency of the Mohozi project as we look into the future. Uh, this conversation about the Mohozi project, I, I think, started with uh, with uh, General David at uh, Mifosa or the, the General David the producer, who is popularly known. Uh, this guy came out of the army and he told us to be mindful to be careful about the Mohs project. Uh, we seem to have ignored him. Actually, at that time, uh, we did completely ignore, uh, ignore him. We slandered him. Or we dis distanced ourselves uh, from his words, from his letter. We did not want to hear anything about, about it. Uh, in 2013, there was an article in the Independent uh, that stipulated that the, the, the NRM was planning uh, on tampering with the constitution to remove the edge limit clause. Uh, we did not take them seriously. Should we start looking at these things more critically? Uh, should we start having more uh, conversations that actually inter interrogate issues at a close range that we actually take everything serious. And should we start working with 
people who have been uh, who have closely worked with Museven who seem to know him better. Is that something that that, that we should start considering? Mitala, what do you think? I think. Uh, because I remember, I remember when uh, Sebusa came to, to London, he actually gave uh, so many lectures about what's going on, why we should be ready, why we should in, ensure that we get rid of this guy now. Uh, mm. We did not. Uh, the SFC is led by uh, General Mohos right now. Uh, it's probably one of the most uh, powerful or the, the, the most elite uh, army branch within the Ugandan army forces, even though, uh, according to Honorable Semuju Ibrahim Nganda, it is not legally uh, recognized uh, through the, by the Constitution of Uganda. But when people talk about the Mohos project, what should Ugandans think about? You know, I think as you said, there is a tendency among the stars, and I, I would say it's a general human weakness. I'm not going to call it, you know, a Ugandan tendency because it's not specific to Ugandan. But I think as human beings, there is a tendency to to take things lightly, you know, without uh, you know taking time to seriously look into the proposals that have been put forward, and you know, to analyze them and understand what they mean, what is the effect, and what's the likely implications, and so on and so forth. It's a, it's a it's a common mistake. I think it's uh, possibly due out of short-sightedness, but also on the other hand, it's just uh, sheer lack of interest in what's going on around us. I think this is where some of these problems emerge from. Uh, because, uh, for example, the example you've made about the, 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 the various constitutional amendments, including the age limit and the terms and so on, most of these things usually tend to start as a joke, you know? Somebody comes and uh, plays uh, a small piece of information into the general public. It's like they are just testing to see what is the mood, what is the likely possibility that the idea might become, you know, acceptable. And the, the process has already begun. I think this is this this is normally what happens. So it's possibly not far fetched to say that he's interested in being, uh, you know, head of state. Which by itself wouldn't be a problem for me as long as he subjected himself to a credible, legitimate, you know, electoral process. But we all know that that's not what is happening. You know, we, we yeah, are actually. Yes, at, 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 according, at, according to the Ugandan constitution, you cannot hmm. be president of Uganda when you are not born in Uganda. I, I was, I was, I was, I was going to mention that. I was going to mention that. I mean, okay. it's, the, 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 alleg the allegation has been made that he wasn't born Ugandan, you know, so maybe that is something that, you know, the public this time around might need to take very carefully. You know, those clauses were... Mr. Mohozi, Kainelugawa, was born in Tanzania. According no, to those, cl those, clauses, those clauses were put in place for a reason, you know? Exactly. And I think maybe this would be an opportunity, you know, for people who are... You know, around those tables to make sure that they, they they don't mess about with the constitution as they have done previously, because had people not messed about with the constitution, I bet you that possibly Mr. Museveni would be the former president. He would be happy to start in Rachitura. He's got a very successful cattle business there. I saw even he exported, you know, uh, by of course, uh, you know, artificial means. He exported some Angola cattle. To South Africa now, where you know they are they are selling in billions and billions of dollars. So he's got uh, you know an enviable estate to retire to and, and 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 be a statesman and you know enjoy his retirement. But he doesn't seem to be looking at that. His project, the end project, is to make sure that he unites Africa. And I don't know how my, how many more years he has in order to be able to do that. But 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 to re, to re, to revert to revert to the question that you raised, it, it is a serious question. It is a serious question. If there is a barrier, a legal barrier, like one that is enshrined within our constitution, that somebody who is not uh, who does not meet a certain criteria to be president, then that's the end of the story. But uh, I'm afraid I am not as optimistic as maybe other people might be, because we have come to learn that uh, in our situation, things happen whether the people want them or they don't, they still do happen. Uh, if we are going to be able to, to, to put up a blockade on that particular issue, yeah, I think the campaign, the advocacy, the noise has to be 
really loud and it has to be to, to start now. Yeah, but the, the news hasn't worked in the past. Uh, we are uh, mission 2021. We are moving a dictator. Uh, <laughs> all that has been noise, right? Noise hasn't helped us. Uh, and as you have heard from Spire, uh, we have now handed everything on to God. Uh, my, 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 my worry is, is Uganda ending up in a situation of Chad. That, that is really my, is my, is my biggest worry. I think there was a time when uh, military dictatorships were unpopular on the continent of Africa. There was a time when they were falling like mangoes from trees and people on the African continent had decided that they don't want anything to do with military dictatorships. The military is there, its job is important, but it's only important in as far as protecting the borders and frontiers of the country, not to not to influence domestic politics, especially the way in which the Ugandan army influences domestic politics. Because I think when you look at our situation, the image you get is that every day we are at war. And when you ask, uh, when you ask uh, professional soldiers who have been professionalized and have got many friends within that institution, when you ask them on a one-to-one, -one, are you guys really professional as you claim to be professional? Because your attire and your, 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 your gun seem to be pointed towards the people whom we are supposed to be protecting. And it's just really baffling, you know, at that point in time. But... Uh, Henry, some of these are really deep sitting questions. I think as a person who believes in, in order, in rules, in my circumstances as somebody who is uh, who is who has got a legal background, I, I really like to respect laws and rules. I really like to respect that. So if our constitution is saying that in order for you to be in a certain position, you need to meet this criteria A, B, C, B. If somebody doesn't meet that criteria, that should be the end of story. Uh, I don't know what will happen in the future. My, 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 my gut feeling tells me that you know bad things are, are coming ahead, and I've and I've been and I've been having this conversation with people that 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 I that I, I interact with daily, and I'm telling them that you know I'm really I'm scared, I'm worried about Uganda, you know. The signals that are coming from there, they are not good signals. So we can only expect that things are going to get worse. I see a president who is very angry. The people who are around him are angry. There is no allowance for reasonable you know, discussions. We can disagree and we don't need to take out each other's eyes. And I don't understand why as a country where we all possibly speak the same language, we are intermarried, we are connected by blood and so many other things, you know. I don't understand why it is necessary, you know, to, to, to treat somebody in such a brutal manner in a way in which our brothers in uniform are treating our brothers elsewhere. It doesn't make sense for me. When I look, when I think through it, it just, just doesn't make sense for me, but that could be just me who doesn't have enough brains to understand and put things together you know, why the, the situation is the way it is. And just in the last six uh, months, just in the last six months, when you look at the statistics, uh, over 100 people have been murdered or killed, or they have lost their lives. Uh, and those are the, the unfortunate ones. Uh, the, the lucky ones uh, who are still alive they have been incarcerated, over 280. Most of, of them are youth. How many families are being affected uh, by the repressive government of Mr. Museve? Uh, and is he thinking about changing his approach to governance, uh, especially as he continues to age? Uh, in Uganda, there is a saying that Wuka de Magezi, but uh, in this case, I don't know if that exemplifies uh, th th that proverb. Uh, and uh, you talked about wars. Every day, it seems every day we are engaging in a war. Uh, bad things are coming ahead for Uganda. This might sound as jokes but they might be the reality of the future of Uganda. Uh, one of the elders, uh, the, uh, the Ugandan elders, was giving an analysis of 
why it is very important to have the legitimacy, the people's legitimacy in government. Uh, and he posed the question uh, of, uh, about who we are fighting all these years that we have been fighting and fighting, but who are we fighting, right? Uh, at some point, he said that Uganda was one of the, 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 more, the most, uh, the better, the better country within East Africa, but now it's at the bottom. Uh, actually, this is what he says. Let me, let me just play this clip. Kwa government, ngabantu befuga, bakiriza okufugiwa. E concept ye bawala, e yo ngabako la American Revolution ye yo. Government by the consent of the governor, mumara kukiriza. How? Mumu ronda, abana abakule embera. Bebo. Mumu kwala wo, e ntegeka, yo kubafuga, jibaita constitution. Kasta muta jikiriza kanyake yo. E mire 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 mba montaro. And yeah, I take money. We do that for independence. One way, Uganda is singer. We come here to grow Mr. Afi. Cut foot to Zimbabwe. Bobo Zanzibar. Nintalo. But it's way to run your sani. Abana Kenya, Abana Rwanda. They are the bad guys. Abana Congo. They are the bad guys. Abana Basuda. They are the bad guys. They are the bad guys. Abana Rwanda. But Tanzania. Nintalo. If you put one on one, eh? Abana Uganda. I'm in Kenya. We make about thirty percent of budget a month. もうあの、もうね、もうかのもかも。もうかのもかも。ああ、エッセントのメージ、あの現状コインダストリーズ、ネイビライブ、ナバ、もうかのバコラ、ネイスに嫌がら。すぐらもんど。あれなんかそのね
and perhaps at certain points, maybe the soldiers and the president gets bored without war, the guns are turned to the citizens, the guns are turned to civilians. We had at some point in the 90s and maybe early 2000, but mostly in the 90s, there was this uh, sentiment, the army is being professionalized. Uh, in the past, you would see these people around in bars on the streets, but these days we don't see them, they are in the barracks. But today, what's happening? Every other day, the police doesn't seem to be trusted that much, maybe because they don't exercise enough violence or they don't instill enough fear into people. Every small thing happening around Kampala, the army is out, A military police is out out with huge guns and you're asking yourself who are these huge guns being aimed at whom do these people want to shoot the tanks that we have been seeing in kampala around election time and when the president was swearing in what were those tanks for uh, to uh, whom were they sending the message was it sent to us the citizens that if you try to protest or if you try to go against the will of the president we can use these tanks against you. Under normal circumstances, these things should be working or should be aimed at protecting the integrity of the country, should be aimed at protecting our borders, protecting our sovereignty. But it appears that's not it, except when they are serving as mercenary forces in Somalia or elsewhere, which we would appreciate maybe in a Pan-African spirit when they are doing that. But when the army seems to be most um, taken to be the most important thing in a country that everything that fails especially failing in the same hands of the same government they say we are now bringing in the army nads we are now taking hands uh, rather we are putting nads in the hands of the army uh, when uh, our engineers fail on the roads we are bringing in uh, military engineers you clearly see that in the mind of President M7. Force seems to be somewhere at, uh, it seems to be taking uh, a very a very privileged position. That right. even when he, uh, prete when he acts as a, dip as a diplomat or as a Democrat, it's mostly where he's just waiting for uh, to be pushed a little more to pull out the violent part. As uh, the philosopher Machiavelli says, and it appears many of these leaders are following him, that it's good to be loved, but you work for being feared because love can always be withdrawn. Love depends on the one who is giving it. But if you instill fear, you're the one in control of it. And that's clearly what he's doing. Instill fear and you'll be in charge because <laughs> no one else will be it cannot be withdrawn. It's you to withdraw it. Right. So that's but basically but, what I'm saying where we are going. Well, but mm. Machiavelli also advises such leaders to ensure that they mm. turn uh, their, uh, their governed into citizens. Because when you turn the governed into citizens, then you can have conversations with them. So mm. even though creating fear is very important, at the end mm -hmm. of the day, advises that your citizens should love you, the governed should become mm -hmm. citizens and they should love you and they should, you should be able, because when you love people, you have conversations with them. You don't terrorize them because you see yeah, that. As that's, that's the ideal, but since the bigger aim is to control power, if right. love <laughs> fails, then you instill uh, fear. But unfortunately, in most cases, when we are referring to Machiavelli, we fail to appreciate that he was speaking to a different audience and at different times. Right. Machiavelli right. was uh, advising uh, the prince as the title of the book, advising leaders at his time in the context of unifying Italy, that that's the kind of yes. leader that they needed. But we mm. take it out of context that this is what everyone needs in order to stay in power and to control it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Mm. Um, uh, Mr. Mitala, your, your, your response to that? Uh, you know, they are, they are, they are, I've, I've made, a, I've made an analogy here, I've made, I've made an example here that uh, I grew up around the marching area, you know, Kerezia Zoni, somewhere there, 
Mubala, car, that area, those were the places where all the boys that I played football with when I was a young boy you were around that place. But I remember just before I went to primary three or somewhere there, just before Mr. M7 captured power, we had a scenario where there were these people who were mercenary soldiers. I think that they, there's a term that they used, they, they used to, to refer to them as, and I think these were the, the deadly days of Bandagari, you know. And I remember that uh, my, grand, my grandmother had a very small retail shop just on the, uh, below matching the military barracks. But every time, you know, soldiers came from that place, you know, you would begin to hear the, the noise from so far away and villagers were, would be warning other villagers, Babo, Sajja, Babo, Vajja. Then, you know, the whole village would scamper, you know, and then these guys would come in, they would they would comb the village. They would take even food. If, if you happen to be having food cooking on the stove or on the sigiri, you know, they could, they, they could walk away with it. This is how terrible, you know, for me, the image I have and the memory I carry from that from that era, I, I I always find it very very difficult to reconcile that image with the image that I'm seeing today. And obviously, for young people, and I, I'm referring to them as young people, young people who are much younger than me, who are people who are born maybe in 1980, and because that's the average age of majority of Ugandans now, very young people, and possibly they didn't have a direct experience of these things, and maybe. If they did have a direct experience of these things, maybe they experienced those things through their parents who may not be there any longer to be able to, to be able to pass on that information to them. So my construction, my point of reference is I refer to that scenario and relate it to the image that I'm seeing in Uganda today. And it, it, it sends shivers down my spine, to be honest. I, I never, never at any one point anticipated that them seven who came to be a savior, the Museveni who talked about all the abnormalities of, uh, of of the past leaders, the people he castigated and called them names of some sort, the people he hated to see their pictures hanged up on the mirrors, he's reflecting himself in a similar style today. I think that is uh, that, that is really the lowest that as a country really we, 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 we can bend. What, 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 and, uh, yeah, go on. I, I was wondering, uh, uh, this is the beginning of a new era in Uganda's uh, political history. Uh, what would you want Mr. Museveni to do in his term? Assuming that he's listening to you today, uh, wh what advice would you give him? My advice would be for him to be a statesman. Yeah, and the statesman is somebody who puts country first and himself last. I think the Ugandan population has given him a good 35 years or even more. You know, they have given him a good 35 more. You know, paying him directly from the from the coffers of the state. Obviously, he says that he only earns a three million shillings. Therefore, that's nothing for him. But you know, for an ordinary Ugandan, three million shillings is quite a huge sum of money. So if you calculate that three million shillings, you know, on a monthly basis for 35 years, that would make an incredible difference in somebody's life. But I think uh, I think Ugandans have given him. I, th I think possibly Uganda has given Mr. Museveni much more than what he has given. He has he has given back, and I think. Uh, he, he should really think about the Uganda without him and seriously prepare that Uganda so that even when he himself goes back to his resting place, you know, his offsprings and everything that he has worked hard for, if there is anything like that, he should be able to, to, to survive uh, post Museveni. That's, that's, that's what I could say to him. Yeah, uh, okay. Well... Actually, so I just uh, uh, found out that the, the, the name of the clip, the, the name of the elder in that clip is uh, Mr. Israel Mayengo. I have, uh, it has oh, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Israel mm. Mayengo. But uh, Mr. Israel Mayengo asked a very fundamental question. When you talk about all this, uh, the amount of money we spend in buying uh, ammunitions. Ammunition that ends up 
uh, being turned against us, the people of Uganda, uh, when we have no doctors being paid, when our doctors are not paid well, like most most Ugandan doctors are running off to South Africa. Uh, some are even running away to, 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 to either Europe or the US uh, because of poor pay in Uganda. Uh, we do not have uh, equipment for cancer. People are dying of cancer now. A lot of people are dying of cancer. Uh, in this era of COVID, people are dying because they do not have ventilators uh, in hospitals. Uh, I don't know how far the vaccination project has gone uh, in Uganda, but uh, uh, w when you think about a country of more than 40 million people, uh, when the government has not put a systematic uh, way of immunizing her people during such a pandemic, you wonder, what, why did they even spend the 7.7 .7 billion shillings in organizing an inauguration where, where, which was uh, almost entirely attended by international actors or international visitors. <coughs> Spire, what are yes. your thoughts on that? Yeah, politically, you would understand it, or you would know what they were really trying to do. It's about trying to <coughs> put up a facade of legitimacy that uh, you have to show the entire world that look uh, uh, this is a more process uh, the, the fanfare the jets in the air uh, the show of military might it's about that because if it's not there uh, he knows there would be questions there uh, but is this really a transition so he has to show that there is a transfer of power from the former president to the new president who has been elected by the people. So even if he may not have been elected by the people, it's important to put up that show. And it becomes a reference point afterwards. We have a president who was sworn in. You all saw uh, the occasion was colorful. So all that color is not... Um, uh, is not simply for show's sake. Of course, as you say, it's quite unfortunate that we spend all that money uh, with such intentions of simply trying to uh, put up appearances of legitimacy where it's not, yet we have other more pressing needs. I just lost um, <clears throat> a neighbor a few weeks back uh, to cancer. The poor lady had stayed in the house for over a month. Uh, that's when I got to know. She had stayed in her house for over a month because she, she had heard of the stories of what happens in Mulago. So she had feared going there, uh, that she would need to pay some money. But then that there are these queues, you would have to stay so long in the line to be attended to, except if you knew someone there. Why would a country where someone has been president for 36 years, where he's boasting of a peaceful, um, a peaceful uh, stay in power that long, fail even to have more than one center, one cancer treatment center, that with now over 40 million and cancer on the increase, all the people from Moroto, from uh, Soroti, from uh, Nebi, they all have to come to Kampala to be attended. So sometimes we blame these doctors who are there, but they are also overwhelmed. When you go to that institute, you realize that what the need is much more than their capacity. But to see that that is what we have, and at the same time in the same country, we are showing off jets, we are showing off military might, uh, we are paying people to eat and drink because a, a president who, <laughs> who fears his own people is swearing in. It's quite <laughs> unfortunate, but you expect it, as I said earlier, that whenever a leader overstays in power, and they are not doing things that people want, towards the end, they will rely more on force. They will rely more on military power. And we are going to see that increasingly. You, can, you could do a comparative study in other countries that, had, that faced the same kind of scenario. And you'll notice that it has been the same trend, that even in those countries, the budget of the military 
surpassed or was unproportional to the budgets of other critical sectors. So it's just a pattern and a pattern that is followed by um, a certain kind of leaders. And again, this is why uh, there are some people who say that, but what is wrong for a leader to overstay in power if they are being voted for? If uh, their people are choosing them to continue leading, even if there was no rigging, even if it was true that M7 was uh, uh, winning legitimately, I still think that it's not a good thing for a leader to overstay in power to the extent that he has stayed. Because naturally, over time, you run out of ideas to run a country. Second, naturally, over time, you get engulfed by a wide circle of friends and uh, patrons and people that you have to appease, part of whom would be part of the problem, but you cannot do away with them, which is what we see with President Museveni. The other reason is that when you overstay in power, or maybe when you have just come into power, usually there is that energy. There is that uh, uh, passion that one comes in wanting to change things. Uh, Mitala said earlier, uh, in reference to Tanzania, you see uh, the new president is trying to change this and that. But for a person who has stayed for too long, they look at everything as though it's normal. So it's just continuation. I saw when um, the um, uh, the chair pass the is it the chairperson of NRM. Um, that's honorable, I Mr. forget Chibu. her name. Uh -uh. Uh, the, uh, Lumumba. 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 So, yes, uh, I saw at the swear in, yes, the Secretary General, she was being asked um, what uh, plans they had for the new term that the other one was labeled Kisanja Hakuna Mchezo. Uh, this is Kisanja what? And she said that it's Kisanja securing your future. So, something as yeah. vague as that that you reach a point where you no longer have anything to tell people. Nothing new for you, it's just a continuation. When M7, uh, Mr. M7 walks into State House, I think he still sees the same State House where he has been for the so many years and it's now more a home. So it's like we are pushing him out of his home. But right. if we got a new president, and that's why uh, for me I was even for the idea that we might not get an ideal president replacing uh, Museveni, at least the one immediately coming after him, but one that would have given us the, the conviction that we can remove a president, we can change. Second, that person will have some excitement to change some things, and at that level, they want to appease people. President Museveni doesn't want to appease us anymore. He knows he can get away with whatever he wants to do. So right. that new person would have wanted to change things. They would have wanted to appease people. They would fear making mistakes because they want to make a mark. Right. Uh, the old president uh, does is not really uh, thinking about those things of making a mark. He's just continuing with his long rest. So even if we got a president that is not really ideal, the changing itself would have told us that you can change. And if that president made a mistake, I'm sure the election coming after the one that would have brought them in, people would be more determined to push them out. If we got Bobby Wine or Muntu or Kano Kiza Vesije uh, or uh, Amuriat, I think it would be relatively easier to remove them right. uh, than someone who has become part and parcel of the state and where people believe a number of them them that it's impossible to remove a president, impossible to change a president. I don't know whether you noted that the turn up was even lower than it has ever been. I think we hit the lowest this time. Was it uh, 50 <laughs> something percent? Why do you think many people yes. are not voting? The, pre the president said that even those who did not vote are mine, <laughs> that the opposition scared away. <laughs> 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 which is quite <laughs> laughable. He has to appropriate everything. So since I only have 58%, everyone who yeah. stayed away, those are my votes. You scared <laughs> them away. <laughs> well, 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 <laughs> that I, is because I, I many think... people no longer see the meaning and they think it's <laughs> impossible even if you go there to vote. So many of the young ones who are seeing it, we are removing a dictator who still had some hope. 
I don't know if in 2026 they will turn up to vote again. I, know. I really I know. I know, but uh, as a professor of philosophy, uh, as an, uh, mm. a teacher of philosophy, you should know that uh, uh, Mr. Mm. Museveni's appropriation uh, of the people who, who refuse to, 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 to leave their homes and go and vote are uh, implicitly mm. consenting to, to, to the status quo. Mm. Uh, so as a professor of philosophy, you should know that uh, mm. is, is uh, appropriating consent, implicit consent. These people did come out to vote, mm. so uh, that yeah. part, no, <laughs> I, I would look at it differently. In logic, there is what we call appeal to ignorance. Right. Uh, the fallacy of appeal to ignorance is committed when you move from the premise that we don't know mm. and you end up with an affirmation. So we right. don't know why they did not vote and the affirmation that follows, they didn't vote because <laughs> they were... Suffering. They, they, were, were they were intimidated, <laughs> but they were mine. We are just ignorant, although we have certain hypotheses, assumptions, why they did not. But of course, a person who is desperate for anything to come to his side, just like someone who has um, a container that is almost empty or half, when they are seeing mm -hmm. that. Oh, everyone must be wondering why is my container only mm. having this yet I had yeah. all the power <laughs> to distribute what was happening. So I have to say that everything you see scattered there on the ground is mine. Even what is in their containers is mine. People made mm. mistakes and put it mm. there. Yeah, it, 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 is, it is just that dangerous, you know, yeah. that paternalistic, uh, that, that kind of paternalistic approach where, you know, somebody is really so much inclined in pushing his own interest forward against the interests of anybody else. It is unbelievable, it's incredible, but it's as equally sad as it is incredible. <laughs> Mr. Spire, would, would you say that uh, Amoho's president, even though not ideal, would, mm. uh, would start that evolution of uh, change of presidents or would that be a lie in itself? I depends. Uh, Mohozi president with Mohozi coming in in which way? If right. it's a Mohozi president coming in through uh, the vehicle pushed by his uh, father or as some sort of a dynastic presidency, then that's not what I'm talking about. Okay. What I'm talking about is any other president coming in through legitimate means, giving us the idea, giving us the conviction or a feeling that we can change presidents, that our mm. vote counts. This time we have made a mistake. We have voted for someone who has not performed as per our expectation expectations, mm. but we can change them. So if it's Mohoz coming in, but riding on the back of his father with state resources, uh, with all the uh, patronage and everything, still as people would not have fe felt that it's us changing. So that might not bring about the effect that I talked about earlier. Okay. But it's not that I feel uh, Mohoz should not become president, although there is a, a bit of a difficult there negotiating at the a normalcy of a Mohozi president, even if you say, as uh, Mitala said earlier, that it's okay for him to become president if right. he's ready to go through the normal channels. We know that is impossible. We impossible. know that he cannot go through the normal channels as long as his father is president, organizing an election where he participates. We know that it's going to be like it has been in his own elections that he has been organizing. So that's why the ideal should have been that under normal circumstances, a son would not participate in elections where the father is the one who is in charge of organizing those elections. It's a clear mm. conflict of interest where naturally we know what the president is likely to do in the favor of the and, son. And, 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 and just to jump on the back of that, and Henry, I'm sorry because I'm, I'm conscious of the time, but just to, to jump on the back of that, I mean, it, it's been it's been public a public public affair now where we saw the two children of the of the current minister minister for foreign affairs being uh, initiated as ambassadors in different countries, you know. Right. And you know, they, they may be qualified, but there is that obvious perception of something that's abnormal. That he is uh, 
you know, of all in the pool of all people who could possibly become ambassadors and diplomats, you know, in the whole pool of mm. all those people. There is strictly <clears throat> two people who seem to be linked to the current Minister of Foreign Affairs, and they are being propelled into positions where how they got in there, nobody knows how they got in there. I think those are the things that kind of perpetuate the unfairness, which, uh, you know, makes people who are even middle ground, it pushes them really to the edge and say, this is something that is absolutely unworkable. We cannot accept this kind of abnormality. Hmm. Linked to the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Foreign Affairs, right? Linked yeah. to the Foreign Affairs, by blood. By blood. Yeah, not just... It's, it's, it's got to be incredible. You know, these children must be geniuses. Right, right. Like in their lifetime, when their father is the foreign affairs minister, I'll, they I'll are able to become the ambassadors themselves. That's, that's genius. I think uh, I think maybe Uganda, we, we seem to have just got short of producing or recording something brilliant in the, in the world book of genius records. Right. Mr. Mitchell, why don't you go ahead and wrap up uh, your your final thoughts on this and uh, uh, your your my 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 final my final thoughts projections that, uh, for the future. My 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 predictions for the future. Um, um, I really don't want to be the one who gives the bad news, but uh, you know sometimes the bad news has to be given. It's just like uh, when you lose a relative in an accident or maybe in some situation and the police, you know, turns up at your door, you know, and they have to give you the bad news. You've got to take the bad news how it is. I think uh, we are in a very bad state. As, as, as a nation, I did not see the president, you know, reassure the nation that he's capable to govern in the middle ground and, uh, you know, accommodate all the different, you know, views of people. I saw a president who is very angry, and uh, I think from that imagination, I think the president is going to be more brutal, and I think it's unnecessary. Right. Uh, <laughs> Spire, your thoughts, but uh, mm. uh, as you give us your final thoughts and predictions, I, I want you to engage with uh, Brad. Brad. Brad is a colleague from, uh, from the University of Toronto, and uh, that's what he has to say. Mm. Are you able to see that? The comment on... Uh, mm. Are you able to see that comment on me? Yeah, yeah, I can see it. Yeah. If... Uh, <laughs> Responding to, to what I was saying earlier on. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Yeah, but I don't know what uh, Brad means by active disengagement because <laughs> it appears to be a contradiction in terms. If you're disengaged and then active, I don't know what you would be doing. Is it actively sitting back and looking whereby the activity is in watching? <laughs> so I, I don't know exactly it, what is, is, Brad it, it means. Could be, it could, he could be referencing a boycott. A boycott? Oh yeah, <laughs> maybe I don't know. I don't know what is this. We don't, I don't know, know what, what he means, mm. but uh, we yeah, don't know what I, you, your definition of active disengagement really means. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, so that six alternative parts so openly challenges the legitimacy makes a difference. If he meant a boycott. Unfortunately, even boycotting doesn't seem to make a difference. Boycotting elections. You boycott, they'll organize them, they'll uh, as well uh, parade their own competitors, and they'll beat him, they'll beat them mm. flatly. Right. And with their own competitors, they'll play so clean. The election will appear to be smooth, free and fair. They will not mm. butter them, well knowing that in any case, people are not going to vote for them. He, he so just clarified I, it that he was thinking about a boycott. There we are. <laughs> so yeah, he yeah. That so precisely. <laughs> for a boycott, it makes it even smoother for them because either way, they'll make it appear legitimate. We organized elections. They refused to participate. The elections went on smoothly. 
a president who was elected and here he oh. is swearing in oh, oh, Maybe oh, all, all, all we could all we could have a, a katumba oi president or well. that's, that's <laughs> a possibility <laughs> as well <laughs> just like what happened uh when i think we also have the happened. president with the uh, i think we also have the president with uh uh zirituaula leaving kcc uh, at the time uh, <laughs> Because he was boycotted. Mm -hmm. well, there's, there's that precedent about Zitwala leaving uh, KCC, but there's also another precedent within the parliament of Uganda where certain no. MPs. But if God gave us heads, gave us hands, gave us an ability to imagine, an ability to change things, and at the same time we run back to him, it's like we are saying, the heads you gave us have failed us. <laughs> so please come and intervene through a miracle. So I don't know what to say. I can't run back to God as such. I can't run to the benevolence of the president who is clearly not out to be benevolent. And I can't run to the democratic provisions of our constitution because I know who provides that uh, so-called uh, democracy. So mm -hmm. I just keep the hope in that vagueness. Thank you. Right. <laughs> Thank you so much again for joining us here today. Uh, Dr. Spire, uh, I, I'm really sure we are going to have to invite you here again. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Stella wasn't able to join us. Uh, I'm not sure okay. if she's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, going, I'm, I'm going to have to interact with her after this conversation to see if she's actually fine. Yeah, just, 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 just before we go away, can right. we make a request to, to, to Dr. Spire to make it a cartoon of this program so that we can be able to... <laughs> His artistic yeah. representation of the Ebifa Mugwanga state of the nations. Uh, yeah, you know, that, that, that's his prerogative <laughs> as an artist. Uh, well, I, I know some people who have asked me for cartoons, but when I drew them, they hated me for yeah. it. <laughs> so don't ask for it. <laughs> Are you sure? No, no, that, like I said, that's his prerogative as an artist. He will decide how to proceed with that. Uh, yeah. uh, but uh, we're very delighted to have you on this program. We Thank shall you. be inviting you back. Uh, Doc, you. Uh, um, you do have an admirer who is also a regular here. His name is David Kajoba. He's busy right oh. now. He wasn't able to be with us, mm. but uh, he, he was mm. very excited to see that you are coming to join us. He will be coming back on uh, uh, during the first weekend of June, uh, mm. so hopefully he will be with us as well. Uh, I'll let you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, but, well, uh, if I'll be free, I will. Mm. Yeah, so it, mm. we shall be delighted to have you back again. Uh, mm. And uh, as I have said, thank you so much uh, to, to, to both of you. Uh, today it has been a male panel. Uh, one of the, 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 the ladies, uh, our regular ladies, wasn't able to make mm. it today. Uh, I'm going to have to mm. find out if she's fine. Uh, in Uganda, you can never know if someone is mm. fine or not. I spoke to her right before the conversation. She, she actually logged on uh, and mm -hmm. told me that I'm coming back in a, a couple of minutes. I'm just finishing up something. But uh, mm. of course, the, the, the perhaps, I'm sorry. Perhaps maybe we could also have someone who is pro government next time because we had a pan of three. And all of us seem to be on the other side. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, uh, the funny it's thing like is, we are just enjoying our choir. <laughs> I know, yeah. The, the funny thing is that I have been trying to get someone mm. who can speak for the NRM, but I'm unable mm. to get people who are, uh, who are uh, excited to join the, this panel. They say that this panel is too blunt sometimes with, with, with how mm. we say things. Uh, and that scares them sometimes. But if you do have any suggestions of who, of someone who would be interested in coming and engaging mm -hmm. with us on this uh, on these conversations, we are all mm -hmm. citizens. I think Uganda is uh, belongs to everyone. Uh, if mm -hmm. someone is uh, enthusiastic about coming to engage with us, uh, they are very welcome mm -hmm. to come and engage with us. I think we need we need to to, to become more. Uh, if we want to build a better country, we have to, to start with what we do on a daily basis. We have to include mm. even those we disagree with uh, mm. Mm. At, at all levels, pretty much. Uh, because other, if we don't do that, then uh, what kind of country do we, uh, do we promise the future? 
Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. we, must be, we must be willing to engage with everyone else. Uh, yeah. So thank you so much for joining us. This is the state of the, 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 the nation. My name is Henry Sally. Uh, have a great day and we shall continue this conversation next Sunday.